We acknowledge the first Australians as the traditional custodians of the continent, whose culture is the oldest living culture in human history. We pay our respects to elders, past, present and emerging, and we respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. They share the memories, traditions and hopes of the traditional ancestors with the new generation today and in the future. We would also like to thank them for looking after this land for thousands of years. Good afternoon everyone. My name's Karen from Australian Environmental Education and we are celebrating Sea Week today. So for some of you who have joined us for our other sessions this week, um, we've had some fabulous really in good engaging content linking to what's going on in our marine environment and celebrating our oceans. So today I'm going to take you on a journey beneath the waves. I've been scuba diving for over 30 years and I'm going to talk about some of my experiences and show you some pictures um, and videos of those uh, times and it's really great opportunity for you to ask lots of questions as well. So please put your uh, questions in the Q&A. If I've got something here that I'm asking you about and asking you what you think it might be, um, please put the response for that in a chat. Um, first, of all, I'm just going to show you a couple of slides to get started. We're just waiting on a few more people uh, to arrive. So it might be a little bit slow coming in after the lunchtime bill today. So we might just start off with uh, how far you are away from the coast. So if you want to put it in the chat for me, how far away from the coast you are. I'm about 45 minutes to an hour. I'm based in Sydney. Um, and so I'm not too close, but I it does take me a little while to get to the marine environment. So if you want to pop in the chat for me, uh, let me just see. I've got that open for you. Oh, there we go. That's better. Now you should be able to let me know in the chat whether or not, um, well, how far away from the coast that you are. So apologies, I'm having a couple of technical issues on my end here. So apologies, everyone, for that. As I was saying, I'm about 45 minutes um, to an hour from the coast. So Australia is a huge place. We do have a lot of coastline. And the majority of people in Australia live within about 50 kilometres from the coast. Hi, Dylan, do you want to pop in the chat how far away from the coast you are? So Australia, majority of our people, as I said, live on that coastal fringe. And that means that we do have a lot of impacts on our coastal and marine environments. From things like we saw yesterday, talking about marine pollution, um, also things like runoff and sediment that impacts our seagrasses and kelp, and of course the Great Barrier Reef, we have impacts there from um, oh, about an hour and 10 minutes from the coast we've got there as well. So I did this session um, a little last week to people in North America and someone said it was 17 hours for them to get to their closest coastline. So it's another reason why learning more about our marine environments is so important. So I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started looking at some of the different marine environments and the ones that I explore most. So I've got extra pictures on Sydney's Rocky Reef, which is like a not as warm as our tropical waters and they're the environments that I scuba dive most around here and also some extra things from the Great Barrier Reef which I was very lucky to spend a week on uh, last year. So please pop your questions in the Q&A and um, we'll get started. So this is what it's like when you're just about to go onto the water. So you're looking some above and you're looking below. So if you've ever been snorkeling, you might sort of have experienced this before, that sort of half in and half out of the water. Something to be able to see a little bit on land, maybe a boat, maybe someone else swimming, but you can also get a glimpse of what's going on underneath the water as well. So this is me snorkeling. You might notice that I'm wearing gloves. I'm wearing a full rash vest. So I actually wear a full body rash vest, even when I'm snorkeling, often called a stinger suit. 
Um, for me, it protects me from getting sunburned if I'm snorkeling for a really long time. Um, it's also really important if you're in areas that are sorry, very tropical areas, a lot of the sunscreen can wash off and lots and lots of people in the water with all of that sunscreen washing off can actually coat um, the coral. So I like to wear that rash vest so it protects me and the coral as well. And I've got my mask and snorkel here. You might notice that I'm wearing glasses. You might think, how can she see underwater? So some people that wear glasses will wear contact lenses, but I've actually got lenses that go in my mask. So I'm able to see almost as well as I can on land. And I've had glasses my whole life. So I've been able to have something in my mask for my entire scuba diving career. It's also important that you don't scuba dive alone. So this is my sister. This is me in the back. This is my sister at the front. And anyone that lives up at the central coast in New South Wales might recognise this place. This is called the Haven. Now, this was in winter. So you might notice that we've got an extra layer of protection. We're wearing a hood um, because it can get quite cold and you lose a lot of heat out of your head. So this protects us um, and keeps us that little bit warmer. You can start noticing that other than a wetsuit, we're also wearing some other equipment as well. I've got what looks like a backpack on. And what this is, is called a BCD and it's called a buoyancy control device. And what that means, it controls how much we go up and down in the water. So it controls how buoyant or how floaty we are in the water and it's attached to an air tank you can see the tank on my sister's back there that is attached to that bc so it's a little bit like um a life jacket but we can control how much air goes in and out with um a button that attaches from our tank to our um our bcd you might notice what's hanging down here that we've got a computer so we do actually dive with a scuba diving computer. It's got a compass on it so we can work out where we're going so we can navigate underwater. It's got a gauge that tells us how much air we have in our tank. And that's really important because you don't want to use too much and run out if you're not near the shore. So it gives you an idea how much you've got and when you need to turn around and come back to shore. What we also have here is um, how we breathe. So this yellow one here is a regulate, goes in our mouth and that's how we breathe. And I've got a little video that was actually just going to be the audio of what it sounds like when we are underwater because it's not quiet. It can actually be quite noisy, but it is still quite peaceful. It's very different to the noises that we have on land. And what we're doing now is what's called a buddy check, making sure that each other's equipment, we've got our air turned on, we've got enough air in our tank and everything is working properly. So very much about safety first. So we're about to walk along this bridge. And we're going to go into the water. So that was the bridge we were standing on just behind us. And now we're in the water. Once we go down, we can't talk to each other anymore. So we need to use signals. So the first ones are just about, are you okay? Are you ready to go down? So if everyone wants to do that at home or in the classroom, say, everyone okay? We're going to go down in the water. Now, this is a picture of one of our type of marine environments here. This is up in the Great Barrier Reef and our coral reefs have about 25% of the variety of marine life is found in these warm tropical waters. So a very, very important ecosystem, but they're not the only type. We have open oceans, deep sea. We also have these environments here called our mangrove forests. So these are along the coast, all around the world, in, especially in those warmer waters as well. There are many different types of mangrove tree, but what they all have is special roots that either stick up or they're big arch kind of roots and they create a habitat for baby fish. So when the fish are really young, sometimes they're very, very small. Everyone looks at their pinky fingernail, sometimes even smaller than that. And they create these special environments that give them safety and protection. So these small fish can have somewhere to grow up in to big fish. So mangroves um, are very, very important 
um, habitats. And we can see at the bottom there something that looks a little bit like grass, and it's called seagrass. The seagrass habitats are also really important um, protection for our young fish, but crustaceans and mollusks and all sorts of things that are in our water as well. But we also have deep sea environments as well. This particular area here is in a deep sea vent. So usually the further you go down in the water, the less sunlight there is, the colder it gets and the more pressure there is. But around these what we call geothermal vents, the thermal means warm. So it's warmth coming from inside the earth, the geo part. And it's where um, hot gases are escaping the earth and it's actually very, very warm. And for a long time, scientists didn't think anything could live there because it was too hot and it was too extreme. But they've discovered that there are plenty of things living in these weird, strange environments. But the deepest part of the ocean goes down to the Marianas Trench at 11,000 metres deep. There are more people that have gone to the moon or gone to out of space than they have down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. And if you were with us with some of our other um, programs this week, um, when they were talking about ocean plastic, they found plastic at the bottom of the Marianas Trench and I think even sort of a glass bottle as well. Um, Dylan, there's several classes joining us today. So we've got some individual homeschool students and some classes as well. So please feel free to pop your, continue to pop your questions in the Q&A and add any comments to the chat as well. So this environment here, this is the one that I'm used to most. These are called sponge gardens. And these are the environments that are around where I live, around Sydney and further south along New South Wales and Victoria. They're often called sponge gardens. Now, they're not everywhere. So we imagine that a lot of our coastline has beautiful sandy beaches and those rocky outcrops, sandy beaches and rocks. So underneath on those rocks, we'll often find these beautiful environments with sponges and sea lilies. And they will actually move and sway with the ocean current. So just like leaves blowing in the breeze, they move in the water current. And if there's a lot of current and a lot of uh, movement, it can decrease the visibility, which means it's harder to see. There's lots of sand and things in the water and we can't see particularly far. The scuba dive I did this morning at Shelley Beach near Manly in Sydney, we could probably only see maybe three or four metres um, away. So we needed to make sure that we didn't go too far away from each other. Otherwise, you can't see. This area here uh, is called brown kelp and the brown kelp is um, shorter kelp. So we don't have those very tall 20, 30, 40 metre kelp forests like they have down in Tasmania and over in other parts of the world. This is quite short, maybe two or three metres um, and again moves and sways with the ocean current. Both of these are fabulous habitats where animals are hiding and, um, and living and feeding as well. Now the next thing I've got to show you is hopefully the video won't play but hopefully you'll be able to hear the audio of what it sounds like um, underwater. <laughs> strange sound and it's that bubbling so we're breathing in through that regulator and as we breathe out bubbles are coming out um, I will be sharing all of the videos with you as well so you'll actually be able to see um, and hear what it's like scuba diving both in um, the Great Barrier Reef and also locally in Sydney what I have for you here is a blue groper this is probably the first visitor I get when I first go down. So remember, we went okay, we went down under the water and we're, we're swimming along. When we're at Shelley Beach, we've got the rocks on one side, um, usually on our right, as we swim out. And that's one of the ways that we can find our way back again. Because when we turn around, 
the rocks will be on our left side. So it switches around. But the blue gropers are what we call territorial. So they have a particular neighborhood that they look after and they wanna make sure they know everyone that is visiting that area. So the biggest blue gropers are the males and they will just watch us and hang out until we leave their territory. And then when we return and come back in, they'll check us out again. They can be they're quite a big fish, sort of getting over sort of uh, 60 centimetres in size. So they're very much, if I feel like something's right nearby and I look over my shoulder, it's usually one of these fish, the blue groper. And there's some fabulous um, uh, books and movies about this particular species of fish. So down the east coast of Australia where I am, New South Wales, particularly common, but on the West Coast, they're very rare. The next animal that I'm always looking out for is this one here called a moray eel. And I have to say the last couple of scuba dives I did the last two weeks, I haven't seen any. Now, whether or not it's just the time of year or I wasn't looking more carefully enough, um, but usually I do see them. The largest one I've seen is about two metres long in um, the Pacific um, Islands. And, sorry, and it was swimming between two pieces of coral and it was enormous. Usually you don't see them swimming. You actually will just see their head sticking out with those amazing teeth waiting to catch a fish. So it's another reason why I do wear gloves to protect myself um, from these, uh, anything that might try to bite or sting. So the moray eels are absolutely amazing. There are so many different species and I very, I often will see them pretty much all around Australia. Different species. Now what they've got is the rest of their body is kind of hiding through the rocks. So you often will only see a small part sticking out just waiting to catch something with their mouth open very common to see them in that particular pose this is another very common one here this is one of the um rock cod this is the most venomous species of fish in the world so you can't see it as clearly because it's camouflaged so amazingly well amongst the rocks but along their back are a series of spines now, last week when I was um, scuba diving at Shelley Beach in Sydney again, I saw these everywhere. Now, luckily, there wasn't as much sand on the rocks, so they stood out. But you do, they stay so still and they camouflage so well. You do need to be careful where you're leaning or where you're putting your hand. So I'd never seen so many in such a short period of time on one dive. I think we saw three or four um, quite big um, sizes um, just hiding out. So very definitely one to keep an eye out for, but well camouflaged, very hard to see as well. Now, this is one of my favorite animals that I see. So there's a group of animals called cephalopods. They're a type of mollusk. So they're related to snails and slugs, but they are more closely related to octopus squids and cuttlefish are in that cephalopod group and they are my favorite animals to see when I'm scuba diving. I've got a video to share with you on a scuba dive with my sister last year when she found like seven in one dive and again that visibility how far we could see wasn't very good and um, you'll see that the, it almost looks a bit yellow underwater because of that low visibility but she was amazing and spotted them. She even found one a little bit like this with an octopus using things around it to protect itself. So it was using a bit of a shell and something and a bit of bark, I think, to protect itself. This particular one with the black sands is actually from up in Indonesia um, where they have, because it's so volcanic, a lot of their sand is very black. But this is the animal as well that I absolutely am delighted to see. I haven't seen one my last few dives, but these are the cuttlefish. And cuttlefish, some of them are really small, different species, some of them, the dumpling uh, sort of cuttlefish or the dumpling squids, sort of about the si same size as your hand. But these ones are pretty big, getting up to sort of 60, 70 centimetres, especially with their tentacles. Now I talked about different signs that we use underwater. So I mentioned, okay, going down. Of course, when we need to come back up, we'll go thumbs up. 
But there's another one. The one that my sister and I use if we see a cuttlefish is this. So we just go to each other this and that we know that we've just spotted a, um, a cuttlefish and we need to have a closer look. So this is absolutely amazing. They've, this one's got their tentacles up at the front and you can see it's getting slightly lumpy. This particular one isn't the most happy cuttlefish. It's showing that it's feeling a little bit um, unhappy. It could be that it's trying to show someone that I'm too big and I'm too scary, you need to leave. But on the whole, cuttlefish are really interested in what we're doing. They'll come and they'll come up to visit. If they're feeling happy, they'll swim up. I've had one that's almost tried to pull my mask off. Um, and that was a time that I drifted back a little bit to say, no, that's a little bit too much. And if we look really close here, you can almost see a bit of a rainbow on the side, but all of those little dots that you can see, this is how the cuttlefish and the octopus change their color. They've got one of the fastest color changes of any animal in the world. They can change their color in about a third of a second. So when they are trying to camouflage, they will blend in to be the color of the rocks, or um, with octopus, they'll kind of change their texture as well to look like a rock. So not only their colour, but their, um, their texture to blend in. The cuttlefish are usually swimming and hiding under rock ledges. So they'll usually just drift back into the sort of shadow of their rock ledge and they will change their colour to camouflage if they need to as well. But if they're not happy, they will flash in colour. So they can change so quickly, it's almost like they're pulsing. And it's, it can look like a ripple going over their body the way that they change it. Absolutely incredible to see. Um, and really pretty common. One of the great things that's happened recently is uh, down in South Australia in a place called Wyala, they have the giant cuttlefish that come up every year to breed. And that area is now just being protected by the federal government. Um, and so we'll hopefully be able to see that um, those cuttlefish coming up every year for many generations to come. Now, you might not be surprised um, to know that the signal when we see a shark is this. Hand on your head, fin of the shark, really, really simple one, but everyone tends to know. It's like, well, oh, shark, but then you've got to try to find it. So this one here is a grey nurse shark. These aren't really hiding. They are big over two meters in length. Um, if you can look really closely, we can see a sort of a bit of a long tooth there. The gray nurse sharks are fish eaters. They've got lots and lots of very long, skinny pointed teeth. And it means that when they catch a fish, they can get a couple of teeth in and to stop that fish going away. They have very, very different teeth to say great white sharks and tiger sharks that are very triangular and sharp around the edges. So these animals were actually almost hunted to extinction because um, they thought they were very, very dangerous. But they are pretty harmless and their numbers are increasing in the wild really well. So they are absolutely um, beautiful to see, but they are big. You definitely notice how large they are. Someone was just asking there, why is it spotted? Um, a lot of the time, sharks will have slight patterns on them as well. So this is just natural. Um, spots on the particular grey nurse shark here. So it's not um, not anything um, particular. I think most of them are pretty smooth and grey, but they obviously have slightly different um, uh, spots and things like that towards their tail, but huge and big. Um, we were scuba diving last year up at Long Reef, which is up um, just the north side of the outside of the harbour, and one of the sharks, they like to swim back and forth in sort of little valleys or trenches. So we were peeking over the edge and watching them. And then we went all the way around the outside. So we stayed out of their way. But one of the sharks came up and over and was a bit surprised um, to see anyone there. So it just did a quick swoop of its tail. And the sound through the water was huge. It was like a big sort of whack in the water and it didn't hurt anyone it wasn't near anyone but it was just a quick way that the shark could beat its tail to move off quickly in the opposite direction but the sound and how it travels underwater is very different so it it sounds very um different but you definitely notice when the big animal like this one is around this is another type of shark here this one here is called a wobbegong 
Now they get really big as well. Most of the time they are hiding, but every now and again, you'll see them out on the rocks here. And the same way that you had the rock cod camouflaging down the bottom of the uh, rock platform, you get the same thing with the wobbegongs. So they've got these little, little feelers that help them sense and pick up what movement as well, but it also helps them camouflage and the different sort of spots here. This one's called an ornate um, wobbegong. And yeah, this morning, I probably saw five or six of them, but not the whole one being out. I think one that was out we saw was maybe only a meter or so, but most of the time you might just see a tail or one of the sides of the fin sticking out. Sometimes I think, how did they get into that little spot or crevice under the rocks? But they do a great job hiding down um, the bottom of the uh, sand and the rocks. And they're often called carpet sharks for that reason. Now, this one here is a common stingray. These animals get huge as well. If you stick your hands out and look fingertip to fingertip, it's bigger than that. Now, most of the rays that I see are super small, little sand rays that are smaller than your 30 centimeter ruler. But this one, the big common stingray is enormous. And I've had a, a few amazing dives with these. And probably one of my funniest is when I was going over a little rock in the shallows and another, the stingray came over the other side. We're probably only in less than a metre of water. And it was almost like the cartoon moment when the eyes go, whoa. So I saw the stingray. The stingray saw me. We both kind of looked at each other in the eyes and went, oh. and luckily, I went one way and the stingray went the other way and it was all completely fine. But it was you could tell that the stingray was just as surprised as I was to come across it in that moment. Now, please feel free, everyone, to pop your questions in the Q&A as we're going forward. Oh, we've just got one coming in the chat. Oh, wow. Philbert saw a manta ray when it was swimming. Now, that is amazing. Manta rays are really big as well. So even bigger than the common stingray. And one of the ways that you can tell them apart is manta rays are usually really black. They've got far more sort of triangular um, wings, whereas the common stingrays, they're quite almost round. Um, and the manta rays also got some um, down underneath its mouth. They're sort of curved um, feeding parts. Is there a sign for stingray even? <laughs> and uh, Dan, and, um, you know what? I haven't ever done a sign for the stingray. So that could be one that you might invent. It could be a little bit like this out to the side. Um, but usually, especially for ones like this, it's so big, um, you can't really miss it. And with the little sand rays, you often you'll just kind of be pointing as you're going over them. But that's a great one. I think we need to invent one. Um, can either of them barb you? Um, so the stingrays do have a barb. It's a bit hard to see it's sticking out the bottom under the tail. Um, it's not particularly common, but it does certainly happen. Um, most famously, Steve Irwin um, died after being barbed because the barb went into his heart. Um, other people, it might be that they've trodden on them and they can get, um, they've been barbed in the foot or the leg. Um, and it's difficult as well because the barb, once it goes in, it's got little hooks on it. So it's very hard to get out again, certainly without um, making more damage. But generally, if you give animals enough space, um, you don't tend to have a problem with those kinds of things. It is really tricky when you're underwater. It's different when you sort of tread on something. There's often that sort of automatic reaction from the animal or something like the stonefish that it's not even something that they do particularly if you tread on it and those um, spines go into your foot then the venom is automatically going in um, but yeah it is a really tricky one they can I don't know about manta rays specifically whether they have a barb but certainly the common stingray is and there's actually another type called a num ray that has a really really short tail and if you touch it it gives you a little bit of a shock um, so there's there are a few things that you need to watch out for um, in the marine environment that's for sure and that is why we do wear wetsuits we wear gloves and we have all that extra protection to protect us um, from the you know rocks and animals and those kinds of things but to protect the animals from us as well 
So this is taking a big move. So the temperate waters, now I have to say in Sydney, the water temperature at the moment is like 23, 24 degrees. It is super warm, but usually it's a lot colder when we're diving in Sydney. Whereas tropical reef here, you don't really even need to use a wetsuit. We wear those stinger suits to, again to protect ourselves, um, but you're very much, um, it's much, much warmer. And when it's warmer, you can usually dive for a lot longer. It's the conditions are different. And certainly in the Great Barrier Reef, where we are from this photo here, the visibility is far better. You can see much further, like 15, 20 metres. Um, that's how clear it is. And those things make it easier to dive for longer as well. And a lot of time with uh, areas that are coral reef, the sh you can do shorter, um, shallower dives because the sunlight and the coral grow to a certain depth. And so that's where most of the fish life is. Now, this is what we'd call a coral bommie. We can see it's just a lot of staghorn coral. It was actually two types. We can see the spikier one at the front and the smooth one at the back. And it was big, you know, like maybe three, four metres in size, just that sort of coral. But what we can see is lots of different species of fish living there. And what would happen is the when you got too close, all the fish would pull in. So they were hiding amongst those coral stems. When they were feeling safe, they would drift back out and they would be feeding, you know, within sort of 30 to 40 centimetres from the coral. And then if they a big fish went past, they would dart back in again. So they're using that coral for the protection. And if we look right up here, we can see an anemone fish. Now, there are lots of different species of anemone fish or clownfish uh, like Nemo. This one was quite a big one. We can see it's uh, a little bit darker, not that bright orange. It's um, got orange and some darker colours. So in here, in a patch here, was an anemone. So the anemone was nestled between those bits of coral, providing a second layer of protection for the anemone fish. So not only did they have the coral, but the anemone was there to give them extra protection and they sting. So they've got little stinging cells on them um, that other fish won't like. So other predators won't like, but the um, clown or anemone fish are used to. Now, this one here is a turtle. This one's a green turtle. Um, on that particular dive trip, we saw so many turtles. And one of the videos I'll share with you is a uh, night dive of a green turtle, which just looks amazing as it's almost, you know, sort of flying through the water. They can get very big. And the sign for turtle is this one. So it's hands on top of each other with your thumbs moving to show the fins. Another amazing, again, different coral. So we have things called soft coral. So instead of them being hard, a lot of them it seems a little bit familiar and similar to the sponges, but they are a type of coral and they're just a bit softer um, than the hard corals. We're jumping back down to some of my favourite animals here in Sydney. This is a weedy sea dragon in the same big group as seahorses. And what we've got, instead of a pouch, they actually hold the eggs on their tail. So we know this one is a male weedy sea dragon. And I'll just get you to have a close look at the colours because I'm going to show you one in a moment. Let me just stop sharing. So this is one here. I'm going to hold it up and get it to focus. There we go. So the same way we could see it on the pictures, we could see the dots on the beak and the dots and the pattern. So when this one, unfortunately, after a storm had washed up, it either probably had died first and washed up onto the shore. And because it's hard, um, you, they can preserve. So you've got to definitely, if you find one, leave them outside, um, let the ants get to them so they don't continue to smell because they do. And what the, these animals are doing, they're swimming. So instead of like a seahorse that's like this, they will actually swim kind of like this direction. And they'll use this really long snout to suck up tiny bits of food into their mouth. So you can imagine how small the food is for them to be able to eat that. And these, they, these are a fish. 
Um, so even though they've got that sort of hard, almost like an exoskeleton, they are actually a species of fish. And the, there are three types of sea dragons now in Australia. This is the weedy sea dragon. Further south, we have the leafy sea dragon. And there's a new one, I think, called the red sea dragon that's been found in Western Australia. So they're really quite a beautiful and amazing animal. So I've got a couple more things to show you, but I thought we might stop for some more questions while we wait. Um, are there any questions about either diving in Sydney, scuba diving in general, the Great Barrier Reef, or any of those animals we had a look at? Just pop them through um, in the Q&A or the chat. And I will keep telling you some of my scuba diving stories. So the next animal I will be showing you is one of the largest um, animals that I've seen. So I get this question quite a lot. What is the biggest thing that you've ever seen underwater? And that is what I'll show you in a moment. And it's the sunfish. So the question we've got here is when and where was your first scuba dive? So my first scuba dive, was actually down in Jarvis Bay in New South Wales. It was when I did my dive course. So to be to able to be able to go scuba diving, you do need to do some training. I was really lucky to be able to do that training when I was at university. So not university at high school. Um, so I think I was in year eleven or twelve, and there was a field trip down to Jarvis Bay to do the dive course. So I think it was, we did all of those dives in the, in the ocean. So often they'll do some of the dives to practice in a pool and then you'll do your proper dives out in the ocean. But all of these ones, because it's very flat in a lot of Jarvis Bay, we were able to do out in the water. Um, so you also have to do some um, research and some on the books. And a lot of it is around your equipment, how much air you might use, the pressure, how fast you should go up and down throughout the water. And once you learn all of that, you go out and you do practice dives and you do things like taking your mask off underwater, which I still don't like doing, uh, taking your um, BCD off. And funnily enough, it's not something I've had to do very often, but we did it today. So my tank slipped out of the BC. So it had a mesh on it and it just meant it was a bit slippery. So when I was swimming, I could feel it moving around. So I mentioned it to my dive buddy, my sister, and the easiest way to fix it was just to go to the sand, take it off, loosen it, slip it back on and retighten it. So it is one of those things that you do need to do from time to time when you're diving taking your equipment off and putting it back on. So it's those kinds of things that we practice. How deep can you go underwater from Danielle? So again, that depends on your training. So the training that I've done gives me what's called an advanced qualification. So I can go deeper than if I just did what's called open water. And that means I can go far deeper. So it's about 30 metres. Now, in saying that, there's been a couple of times in Bali and in Vanuatu for a particular dive, because I've been diving for so long and I've done so many dives, I was able to go a little bit deeper. Again, it's warmer and the visibility is usually very good. So the deepest I've ever scuba dived to is um, about 45 metres. Now, it's not something that I would ever do in Sydney. Um, it's under special circumstances. And what we have then was a dive master who's like an underwater tour guide. So they know that particular place very well. And so they sort of take you on that. So you wouldn't be able to do that on your own or even just with your buddy. Um, Penelope asked, clownfish have predators and, and what do they eat? So what the... So the clownfish, they'll be eating lots of other little things that they are floating around near where they're living, near where they're um, hiding out in their anemone to protect themselves. So they're going to be eating often sort of filter feeders. So sometimes they're small fish, but sometimes other bits of fish. So if, if there's been a big fish around that's eaten something, often little bits of food sort of float around 
And a lot of the time, that's what the smaller fish are eating. They're catching and eating those little other things that are flying around. Um, in terms of predators, anything that's bigger, that's a carnivore that would eat it. So it really is whatever they can catch. Now, the anemone fish, I think, actually um, protect from the stings, but sometimes those animals will actually sort of absorb the stingers. So other animals don't like to eat them. So it might be that they've got that extra layer of protection as well. But often it is anything that's bigger than you is going to eat you and anything that's smaller than you, um, you're going to try to eat. Okay, there's another question from your class. Maya wants to know where the coldest water on earth is. I'm assuming it's down near Antarctica or up in the Arctic Circle would be some of the coldest water. Now, lots of people when they live in cold environments and they still want to scuba dive, they use what's called a dry suit. So the, the what we were wearing in those pictures is called a wetsuit. Um, and it's pretty standard material. You can We've got five mil wetsuits, but you can also get seven mil wetsuits. And when we get cold, we'll often wear like a vest underneath and, and the hood as well. But in areas where it gets even colder, that's not going to be enough. So what often they do is wear a dry suit. So they're wearing clothes or thermals underneath and a dry suit stops the water getting in. Um, essentially keeping you dry. And so that's often what they'll do when they're in far colder environments. And where is the hottest water? Well, the hottest water is going to be near those hydrothermal vents that I showed you with those weird red sea worms. Some of the water there, they have estimated it's sort of 300 degrees. So that's where the hottest water is in that particular location. But in terms of just generally um, sort of in hot environments, you'd be getting up into the high 20s with some of those waters, especially areas that are shallow. Um, small amounts of water heat up much quicker than big amounts of water. So areas in the shallow seas, you might think like the Red Sea and those kind of places are going to heat up much quicker um, than other areas. But you've also got water currents. So sometimes those water currents bring warm water into areas that have extra nutrients and sometimes even you know, baby fish and those kinds of things. And they travel around different parts of the world. So some areas are going to be warmer than others, even when you think they should be. A great example is this morning. The warm, the water's been pretty nice, 24, 25 degrees, which is a little bit unusual. But think about how, in, if you've been in Sydney or New South Wales, how hot the weather has been here. But as we were swimming, all of a sudden we would get these big currents of cold water. Um, I thought it was quite nice, made my sister cold. So she did the symbol of like this to show that she was feeling a little bit cold in that circumstance. So even on a single place, you can get a variation of water temperature as you go from one area to another. Um, thanks so much for all of those great questions. I've got, We've got a couple more minutes, so I would just like to show you the sunfish, which was that one of the largest animals that I've seen. I think it's the next picture. There we go. So the sunfish are enormous. So probably when I'm thinking of the biggest things I've scuba dived with, it'd be the sunfish, that giant common stingray, and probably the grey nurse sharks. Now, we went for a particular dive up in Bali. So one of the dives we went, we got to scuba dive with manta rays. So it was very exciting as well. And the other dive was seeing the sunfish. They are super weird with the way that their fins sort of are very elongated or long on the top and um, bottom of their body. But their fin at the back is really, really short. So I think that's where they get their name from being the sunfish. Now, as I said, this was one of the deeper dives that we did. The visibility or the distance we could see in the water was really clear. And what we were getting um, was perspective. It was deep blue ocean. So you can see behind it, there's nothing else there. So there was nothing to give you an idea of how far away it was. So I don't know whether I saw a really big sunfish very far away or a smaller sunfish really close. 
So um, this photo is not mine, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, we did see the sunfish and it was absolutely amazing to be able to see. But when I've been talking a little bit about baby fish or juvenile fish, we often will call them larval fish. And the reason I wanted to show this, other than it's really cool, is this is what baby sunfish look like. They have to be one of the cutest things out there. So really super tiny. They're almost got little spikes on them. I think they look like stars. And this is how small some of these larval fish can be. And what I'd been seeing the last few um, scuba dives is so many larval fish. So things that are usually, you know, a meter, 30 cent, the smaller versions of all of them. Often you can tell because of their pattern or their coloring. Other times they look completely different to what they are going to look like as an adult. So absolutely amazing to just sort of slow down and have a look around. So with a lot of these dives, we don't often necessarily go very far. We're often looking under rocks for things like wobby gongs and cuttlefish and octopus and things that are hiding. But the last few, it has just been a little bit of current and just looking up to see the bubbles going to the surface and seeing these big schools of fish. It's an amazing experience. If you remember what it sounded like, the sort of the bubbles as you're underwater, it doesn't, you're weightless. So it almost feels like you're floating. You've got the water supporting you and it's a completely different environment as you're looking around and exploring uh, these amazing habitats. And the, it's the little detail. Every single scuba dive, I've seen something different. And that's what makes me go back again and again. So it's a great thing to be able to grow up and do. I think you can get your scuba diving license as a junior, I think, from 12. Um, but as you get older, you get more experience. When I first started out, I was 17. And I certainly, um, you know, those first few scuba dives, especially when we didn't have the instructors, I was really nervous. But as I became more familiar with it, and I dived with my sister, who's my dive buddy, we've been diving together for about 25 years. So you get used to a certain pattern. So for me, as long as I'm using my equipment correctly, keeping it serviced, following the rules, I've always been very, very safe um, through those environments. Now, we've got, I'm happy to stay on for a few more minutes if we have any final questions. I will be sharing lots of extra information um, to everyone that's joined us today with some of those videos I've spoken about as well. But during Sea Week, it's really important to reflect on our marine environments and what some of the impacts um, to them are at the moment. We've done lots of talking about um, plastics and those kinds of things as well. And I see all sorts of things underwater. So plastic bags, um, not so much um, plastic bottles and cans. A few years ago, before Return and Earn, we saw a lot more of that kind of rubbish in the water. I've seen deck chairs, I've seen whole car tires, I've seen fishing rods, fishing line, hooks, um, all of those kinds of things that end up in, in our waterways. Even after big storms, I've seen you know tree branches um, that have washed out of um, rivers and lagoons um, and they can over time have impacts as well. So everyone, thank you so much for joining me today for this journey beneath the waves to get a little bit of an idea what it's like to go scuba diving and explore those two main habitats, looking at the Sydney um, cooler waters, the rocky reefs, the sponge gardens, and the um, coral reefs in the Great Barrier Reef. There is lots more to learn. We've got another session as well um, tomorrow, which is looking at a little, a little bit of information, but following up with some trivia that has come up in all of our sessions this week. But we will do a bit of a recap if you missed any of those sessions as well. So thanks for joining me this afternoon and taking a journey beneath the waves and enjoy the rest of your day. And remember, Sea Week is about learning more about our marine environments. And this is just the beginning of your journey today. See you later, everyone.